Hello and welcome to Aspire Church Manchester. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. If you stick around at the end, we'll give you more information about our ministry. But for now, enjoy the preaching. Two, verse 11, we're continuing on with tidings from Titus. And the title of this message is Living a Life of True Grace. Living a Life of True Grace. And as you're turning there... You know, you may remember that, uh, you know, there's a lot of things going wrong in the churches there in Crete. Not everything was according to plan, and that there were a lot of people that weren't really living up to the standards that they knew that they should to, should be as Christians. And so the encouraging thing is that uh, it shows that God never gives up on his people. It shows that God is always willing to rebuild and to start over. And I, for one, am thankful for that because there's lots of times in my own walk with God that I've had to start over. How about you? Times when I've had to like, just push that reset button. I remember you know, years ago when I had uh, Windows uh, computers, <laughs> I would always have to, it would lock up, it would freeze, and I'd have to push that reset button, get everything back to the starting point. Uh, don't have that problem too much now with my Mac, but... Uh, that was a little dig because Pastor Allen's always on my case about it. But uh, the point is, is that that reset button was very good, wasn't it? To get things going when you need it, you need it, right? And that's the important thing. God does that here with these churches. He'll do it with you. He'll do it with our church. He'll do it with the churches in the world. Because in case you haven't noticed, uh, in the last year, 18 months, 20 months, we've been in a, a crazy time, not just here in the UK, but worldwide. And if you be, read, which you probably don't, but I do, a lot of articles written by pastors of different churches, various denominations, various sizes, and they've been through the mill. You know, I said yesterday about people, uh, last service, last Wednesday, about, you know, people be ghosting churches. And I, I didn't mean that in terms of how uh, some people have are sick. If you're sick with COVID, I want to tell you, we're praying for you because there are people who are still with that. But I was speaking about it, the articles that I've read about uh, churches that have just lost their membership over a, a lot of different things that have gone on. And that makes me, and I've heard lots of pastors say they feel like it's God's resetting uh, what's going on. I, I don't know how true that is, but I do know that all of these things uh, play into what we're doing here. And I think that Titus was having to walk into a place where there were reset was going on, where changes were taking place. And we have to be prepared for that as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, it, it's more than just a religious, I mean, you can go to a religious church that will just, you know, do the religious ceremonies and that will be kind of it. But if you really want to be active in the word of God and growing in the word of God and seeing God do something, uh, even maybe even miraculous, it's going to take a lot more than just a simple ceremony. Are you following along? So living a life of true grace. We're continuing on, starting at verse 11, New King James Version. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, that den- teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That's how we should live. Did you catch that? Soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. When I first became a Christian, uh, right there, just to be able to be sober in the sense of non Drinking, non-drunkenness was a big deal for me. And so I read those going, praise the Lord. I was all excited just to be sober. But it goes more than that when we look at the word. And then it goes in verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And verse 15, our last verse, says, Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, and let no one despise you. Pray with me here today. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord God, for your 
grace upon this message. I pray for your hearers, your people, the ones that are in person and listening online and in the future. Blessings would come their way, but also an open heart to change and transformation. Let us not remain the same. God, let us open our hearts to the truth and not the deception, the lies of the enemy. God, I bind and rebuke Satan, and I pray that you would do that for us today and that your Holy Spirit would reign supreme in this house and over this broadcast. I pray this today in Jesus, Jesus' name, amen. First thing that stands out to us here is this term, the grace of God. For the grace of God, verse 11 says, that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Warren Wearsby, a great Bible teacher, I think, anyways, he says the great about this passage. He says the grace of God was an abused doctrine in Crete. So Paul paused to undergird his admonitions with a doctrinal foundation. There are some who would turn grace into license, teaching that Christians can live in sin since they are no longer under law, the Old Testament law. So he was saying that he had to take a little break from his admonition, kind of telling them to do this and to do that so that they could understand this thing or be reminded again this thing called the grace of God. The grace that Paul is reminding Titus to remind the people in Crete is the one that's found in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For by grace you have been saved uh, through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. See, the grace of God is that favor, as you all are aware of, that cannot be earned through religious deeds. It can only be accepted as a gift. And sometimes we have to, even as we're trying to build our character and trying to live in obedience and walk in the things of God and, you know, get rid of sinful ways. Always remember what matters most is what Jesus did on the cross and that's what saves us and delivers us. That's the grace of God. It's a gift. Can you accept it? Some of you might have been hard on yourselves recently, maybe a little overly hard on yourselves uh, and you need to understand the grace of God. I think on, we have the picture there that's on our uh, uh, slide. It's a photo of an 18-year-old young man. His name's Brant Jean, and he's hugging a woman, and that woman was his brother's killer. And she murdered him, his brother in the apartment, and while he was testifying in court and she was being sentenced to her sentence for murder, he said, can I come down and give you a hug because I want to forgive you for what you did. He says, you need Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, that's a beautiful example of grace that's extended. And that's what Jesus does to us. Even though we're guilty, he gives us grace to save us and deliver us. People, if they're going to come to church and get saved and give their life to Christ, need to know that it comes through grace and not through works that they need to do to become a Christian. It's the grace of God. Grace is one of the main things that separates Christianity uh, from all other religions of the world. Our salvation is not based on being good enough. None of us measure up. We're all not good enough. But nevertheless, it's based on what we believed. What we believe, not believed, but believe. See, and it says that the grace of God has appeared. This goes right back to John chapter 1 and verse 14, talking about Jesus. It says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You remember that? And we, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. What was he? Full of grace and full of truth. And we need both of those aspects of Jesus. We need fullness of grace and fullness of truth in our lives. Titus 3 puts it all together for us. Titus 3, 4, and 5. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. 
not because of anything we've done, but because you wanted to show mercy. I want to tell you that's something, and I don't want to get too far into this, but all of us as Christians need to show mercy to one another. It's a sad state of affairs when Christians uh, are, are at each other's throat or brothers and sisters in Christ or even members of our own household uh, fail to show mercy to one another. You know, and the way it often works is people say, well, yeah, I'll show mercy, but you go first. You go first. Real mercy says, doesn't matter what you do. I'm going to show mercy. And that's what Jesus did for us. Can you say amen? But I'd like to move on to, from this today because the grace of God, whilst very important, the main focus here of our passage is that this grace that we've received, it teaches us something. It teaches us to live out a godly life. While none of us earned our salvation, because we've received grace, it causes us to live different. It's a transforming power, listen to this, in our lives. It transforms the way that we live. Again, Wearsby says this, grace brings a great responsibility. He says, how can the Christian deliberately sin against the grace and kindness of God? I agree with what he's saying here. There's a great responsibility that's been given to us because of the mercy that we've been shown. The person who's been let off the hook, uh, the person who's gone through uh, all this forgiveness should be a person that begins to manifest that, makes it known through their godly living. Can you say amen? Titus addresses this in verse Number 12, chapter 2 and verse 12. It says, training us to renounce the godliness, or the grace of God rather, trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Putting this into context for the uh, Cretan, Cretan Christians, I'd like to say that that was what they were lacking. They knew about the grace of God, but that's all they were living was just on the grace, on the favor, on the fact that they'd been shown mercy. They weren't living out a godly life that was made the, the gospel of God attractive to others. They weren't doing that. As a matter of fact, they were doing things opposite of that, and it was causing to bring uh, kind of like a, a chaos to the congregation. It was causing problems in the world. It wasn't a, a lighthouse anymore. And this is why we need to practice what this verse number 12 says. Look at the words here. It says, first of all, renounce. Renounce. Reject. Don't hang on to. Let go of. Push away from you. Renounce ungodliness. What is ungodliness? It's simply a lack of reverence towards God. It's a lack of reverence. It's like dealing with God in a casual manner. It's like we're so used to being a Christian, we can say and do anything. We're so used to being a believer, we just act however we fancy. But I'm here to tell you, when we renounce ungodliness, we're saying, I'm not going to serve God in this casual manner. I'm going to regain and recapture the reverence that I need to have before the Lord. While I never think that the church should be filled with pomp and circumstance and all kinds of high ceremony, I don't believe that. But I do believe sometimes we enter into the things of God just far too casually. We don't realize that when we gather in the house of God, the Lord is in our midst. We are the body of Christ. Supernaturally, we are. And that requires something from us. It requires godliness, so we reject, we renounce ungodliness. So the question is, and this is a good question, in our daily living, how do we do that? Because renouncing something, we usually think of like, well, I renounce my citizenship to whatever country, or I renounce this or that, whatever it is, we, we reject it. But how do I do this in a daily lifestyle? How do I renounce ungodliness? Godliness. Well, a little cross-referencing of the Bible is our friend. 
And so 2 Timothy 2, 16 and 17 cross-references with this particular verse. And it says, avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. Hmm. This kind of talk spreads like cancer, as in the case of Hymenaeus and Philetus. So here we see, if we can just avoid words that are worthless and has just more like chatter and not bringing about godliness, holiness, even in our everyday casual affairs, we can begin to see God do greater things. The scripture says, avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. So you can become godly in a quick minute if you'll just avoid foolish talk, if you'll just stay away from this kind of talk. What, you know, and again, that's a very general term, umbrella term here, but I think you get it. I think you understand. It tells us to renounce worldly passions. Worldly passions. What is that? That according to the Greek word that's used there for both these words, it means a desire for what is forbidden. We have to renounce that desire within us for what is forbidden. Have you ever noticed that when you tell someone they can't have something, that they want it more? (laughs) They say, you can't have that. You can't have that. You can't have that. And they're like, but I want it. But I want. You may not even like it, but you want it because they told you you couldn't have it. And that's the way Satan works on our flesh, on the carnality of who we are. And the Bible tells us that we don't have to cast out a a devil of worldly passions, but we have to renounce from within us this worldly passions. It's an instinctive trait that we've received from Adam and Eve, haven't we? You remember the story in the book of Genesis where they were allowed to eat any of the fruit of the Garden of Eden, but they couldn't eat the one tree? We all remember the story. And then, of course, what was the one tree that Satan tried to lure Eve over? The one tree, have the one thing. This is why so many people, oftentimes, some people, I shouldn't say so many people, some people want what they want. This is the essence of what lust is. It's a desire that we have to have and give me what I can't have. Just like with grace, Titus 3 gives us insight into this problem of ungodliness. Turn into Titus 3, 3. We might have it up on the screen now. I can't remember if we put it up or not. But it says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. See, this is what happens when we have ungodliness, worldly passions, lust, not just sexual lust, but desires that are worldly desires in our heart. This is what ends up happening with us. We begin to become slaves to these things. And it begins to affect our relationships with others. Instead of loving our brothers and sisters in Christ, we begin to hate our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what it says. We begin, instead of being happy that someone is succeeding or excelling, we become envious, according to Titus 3, 3. We begin to be people of malice rather than people of goodness. And this is why it's so critical that we practice this word, renounce, reject. It's a fight. It's a battle. It's a, it's a daily warfare. Are you with me today? See, I got to tell you, that Titus 3.3, that's just no way to live, man. It's just no way to live. Who wants to live with malice and hating in their heart towards other people? I don't want to do it. I don't want to be that kind of person. I'm tired of always being that kind of person that everybody, you know, if someone picks on you that you want to feel like you got to pick back, I'm not going to do it. You do whatever you think's best, but the Bible says here, let's not live in that malice and envy. I'm not going to do it. I think we ought to just renounce that. We ought to just reject that. We ought to just decide, you know, I'm living a godly life. Whatever you decide to do, that's entirely up to you. But I'm going to live a godly life. We need to renounce so that we can live self-controlled, upright, godly lives. 
I know, man, the younger you are, the more boring that sounds. <laughs> you know, you're living self-control. No one wants to live self-control. We want to live wild and free. We want to live and be able to do what we want to do and enjoy the things we want to enjoy and live how we want to live and say the things that we want to say. We want to be wild and crazy and enjoy those things. And I totally get that. And I don't think that we have to become boring and straight-laced because of this word. I think what it does is keep our hearts in check is what it's talking about. That we can be people that have, instead of looking back on everything we do with regret, regret. Man, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I act like that? Now you can be self-controlled. And you can have an upright and godly life. And that's what we should desire and we should want and we should be seeking after. We should be wanting to be these type of Christians. You remember the Cretan Christians, they were more interested in self-gain. Do you remember we talked about that? They were interested in uh, uh, just lying, telling the things that they wanted to say to make them look good. They were gluttons, they said, Titus 1.12. And the reason I'm telling you that is because that is the opposite of what God wanted for them. God wanted to bless them. God wanted to help them. God wanted to encourage them. But it was going to require them to live this self-controlled, godly, and upright life. Can you say amen? Verse 14 says, Who gave himself that he might redeem himself, from redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. We should not lose sight of these important doctrines here. This doctrine of redemption. It means the word literally means that he paid a ransom. He paid a ransom. He paid the ransom for our sins that held us hostage. He paid the price on the cross so that we could have our our lives back that we were no longer taken captive by the devil and the works of our flesh. But now we can have experienced the new life in God. We are redeemed. And you may say, well, I don't feel redeemed. I want to tell you, start saying I'm redeemed. What does the Bible say in the, I forget, it's the Psalms. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Because when you speak it out and you say, you know what, I'm redeemed. I know I might have been acting a little foolish recently. I might have been saying and doing some things that weren't really reflective of Jesus Christ. But because I've been redeemed, I'm something redeemed. This is the high point of the story. We were lost and bound, but without that redemption, we're going to remain like that. But because we've received that mercy, that redemption, now he's purified us. And now we're what he calls his own special people his own special people. We've got to stop acting like we're just like everybody else. You know, when I read all the problems that uh, Titus was going to have to encounter when he was going into this situation on Crete, uh, you you know, I was reading through and I was saying, this is just like every other person who's non-believer. They've just added in a little bit of religion. They were acting ungodly, doing wrong things, acting a fool, as we might say. They weren't acting like his own special people. Sometimes we have to start acting like the people that we are. See, we're his own special people. We're somebody different. It doesn't make us superior or better, but it does make us godly. It does make us his. And you all know the passage in 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 and 10. It says, but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. That's us. That's us. (laughs) We need to start saying that we're special. We need to practice that. Live it out, man. When you're pushing your buggy, your, your trolley down the aisle of the supermarket, you're different than that person coming this way. You're different than that person who's jostling with you. You're his own special people. You belong to Christ. And here's a reason why, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh, man, that's wonderful news. Because he's redeemed us. Because he's called us to be his own special people and made us into these people. 
we can now proclaim praises. Why? Because we've been out of that darkness and into his marvelous light, not just into the light, but the marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are now the people of God. And again, that word, who obtained mercy, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And then he zeroes in on what the special people are supposed to be doing. It says that they're supposed to be doing good works, zealous for good works. You want it. You desire it. It's what you want to be. You ought to wake up, go to bed tonight saying, Lord, supernaturally put in my heart the good works you want me to do tomorrow when I wake up. When I go to work, when I go to school, when I raise the kids, when I do whatever it is that you're going to be doing, it's for good works. Again, another familiar passage, Ephesians 2.10, where it tells us, for we are his workmanship. Remember I told you at the beginning of this series that we're not there yet. He's working on us. We're a work in progress. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Hmm. See, recognize with me today that your future is brighter than your present. The Bible says in Titus 2.3, looking for the blessed hope, the blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, maybe next week's not going to get any better for you. Maybe that money that you've been praying for hasn't quite arrived yet. Maybe that miracle you've been asking God for hasn't really manifested itself yet. But I want to tell you, it may not happen in this life, but I've got to tell you, one day that blessed hope is coming because your future is always brighter than your present. Your future is is bright, looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing. One day, we're going to hear the trump of God, man. We're going to rise up. I hope we're in church on that day. I really do. The Bible says that the dead in Christ are going to rise first, but it talks about those who are alive will be caught up in the air to be with him. Wow, what a wonderful truth to, for us today. I want to leave you tonight with one last thought that may not seem congruent with what we've been talking about, but it's in context with what Titus has been going through here and what his instruction that he received. And even though it may not flow congruently together, I got to tell you, that's sometimes how the word, the, the life of Jesus is living a life. No, let me repeat that. Rewind. That's sometimes how it is for those who are followers of Christ and how they live their lives is that there's a flow and then there's this thing added into it. And so the last point I want to make with you and to you today is that leadership is hard. Some things in life are necessary, but they're hard. When you were in school, some things are hard. For some people, math is hard. They have whole memes on the internet about that math is hard now anything can be hard but leadership is hard and every group of people who have a shared purpose need a leader let's break it down to where we're at I mean there's lots of things we could talk about the military we could talk about life we could talk about the church but families need a leader all in the family can contribute to the family, but there always needs someone to lead. Businesses, schools, and churches are exactly the same. They need leadership. And depending on the situation or the state of affairs within that group, more or less oversight is required. If your families have a going through a really difficult time, if you've got a lot of wayward people in that family going uh, wild, then there's more oversight required, more wisdom required, more leadership required, and leadership is hard. And leadership is hard. Titus was in a difficult situation. Those whom he was charged with the oversight of did not understand and would not understand what he was trying to bring. 
They did not understand how dire the things were. So what if we eat too much? So what if we lie a little? And I had to deal with someone who should have known better in the last couple of years, you know, saying, uh, ah, yeah, so what, I lied. I'm like, so what, you lied? Are you kidding me? Is this how far things have gone? See, this is what happens in the world in which we live in. This is how it was for Titus. These people did not understand uh, why he needed to come and set things in order. It was difficult. He was in a place with leaders of leadership. He'd done it before. You can read through the book of Ephesians, book of Corinthians about Titus, and you'll see that he's done this sort of thing before. But here in Crete, this was on a whole other level. This was some serious problems there. So his leadership not only was hard, it was harder. And so Paul tells him this, verse 15, speak these things. He says he makes it clear, this is what you need to teach them. I'm giving you the instruction manual. I'm giving you some help. As your elder, as your overseer, here's the things you need to speak. Exhort and rebuke. We already talked about those words. You know what they mean already. With all authority. Because there's a tendency. Well, let me get to that in just a minute. Let no one despise you. These are not, this is not popular, what he has to do. It's not popular. It's not going to be popular being a leader. That's why not many people want to be leaders because it's too hard. It's not worth it. The pay is low and the work is long. You know, it's a difficult thing. Being a father is a hard thing. Oh, when they're small and they're little babies and they're wonderful, when they're like toddlers and you dress them up and they look just like you and you're, you know, walking down the street and you guys got twinsy clothes on, man, it's wonderful. But man, you know, you got that baby girl, you know, and she put that, she's bald headed, but man, you put that big bow on her, her head, on her head. Oh man, that looks great. You go, this is my girl. Look at that. <laughs> I remember when my uh, daughter, my, my favorite daughter, uh, her hair, we grew long, didn't cut her hair forever, man. Long hair with, she wanted to always wear these massive bows in her head. Man, I just felt like the proud dad every time with her. But I got to tell you, that season changes. Now, leadership as a family becomes hard. (laughs) Becomes hard when they want to take the bow out and put on a short short skirt. (laughs) When that little boy, you know, that was so nice now wants to rumble with the guys from the other side of the tracks. When they don't listen to you any longer, it becomes very difficult. And if you try to be a leader at work, it's going to be just as hard. You think, well, I've got the job. I'm manager. They've got to listen to me. No, they don't. They don't have to listen to you. As a matter of fact, they'll try to undermine you and deceive you. We won't even talk about the church, but you could just imagine (laughs) what you go through. And so the point is, is that Titus, if he's to lead these churches on Crete, he's going to have to do as instructed. The Bible knowledge commentary said this sentence that stuck out to me. It says, Titus has to step out aggressively in his public ministry. Man, no one likes an aggressive leader if they're being aggressive towards you and your way of life and your character and what you're going through. Your sons like it when you're aggressive towards someone else, but if you're doing it towards them, they got their chest out. They want to fight back. Leadership is hard. And that's why Paul says these words, let no one despise you. In other words, Titus, you cannot allow yourself to be intimidated in this difficult situation. Brothers and sisters, as we plod on and press forward in this difficult time, those that are watching online, you know what I'm talking about, going through difficult seasons, We cannot allow ourselves to be intimidated. We have to stand for what is true. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Leadership is hard. Leadership is hard. See, I know as a parent, you have to listen to your children. You have to listen to what they're saying. Sometimes you don't listen enough. You need to hear what's really going on. But I have to tell you, There are times when they're just wrong. There are times when they're just wrong. And the thing that you have to do is bring corrective measures. And no one likes that. No one likes that. 
you've heard this before, is that sometimes parents want to be a friend more than they want to be a parent. Sometimes that happens in churches, in schools, in jobs. People want to befriend the people that they lead. And while I'm not saying you have to be unfriendly, I am saying that let no one despise you as you rebuke and correct and exhort with all authority. I don't know what God's speaking to you today. Maybe a variety of things, maybe all these things, maybe just one little shred of these things. We covered the grace of God, that unmerited favor that we get that extends that graciousness, that forgiveness, that love. It's an empowering grace that causes us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. We become his own special people and He's because he's redeemed us, and purchases, purchased us, purchased us on the cross. And also, leadership can be so hard. Maybe you say, well, I'm going to have nothing to do with leadership. Fair enough. Pray for your leaders. Pray for those that are in leader, leadership. Maybe your kids are doing fine right now. Maybe you don't have any children, but you know parents who do have them, and they need prayer because leadership is hard. Recognize today that all of these things are required. Is God speaking to one or more of you? I, I, I say this all every time. I pray he does. I hope he does. It's the desire. Today, why don't we all stand to our feet? And we're just going to ask the Lord. Why don't we lift our hands to the Lord right where we're at? And we're just going to ask God's favor and blessing upon our lives. Lord, thank you, God, for the grace that's been shed or been given to us at the cross of Calvary. Thank you for the blood that was shed that gives us the grace of God. Thank you for the favor that has blessed us with this. Help us to renounce. Help us to get rid of ungodliness. Let us not treat you casually in a manner that's not worthy of your name and who you are. Lord, forgive us and wash us daily as you've redeemed us. Let us be those kind of people, Lord God that are special and walk in that specialness, not with superior attitudes, Lord God, but recognize that we're separate people, holy people, called to do great things. God, leadership is hard. Titus somehow was able to go in there and do this. Help us to do that in our situations, to stand as leaders, Lord God even in the face of adversity, even in the face of antagonistic spirits. Lord God, in homes and families, I know that there are parents watching, parents that are listening here in person and that are going through difficult times. Help them to be those leaders that they need to be, to be aggressive as Titus was. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Thank you all for coming tonight. We really appreciate you being here with us this evening. Those that have watched online, thank you for participating. We're going to be back for youth here Friday night, 7 o'clock, uh, as Brother Lillian testified on uh, Sunday, how powerful the meetings have been because the young people are getting involved. They're wanting to hear from God. They're wanting to see God do some good things in their life. And, of course, we'll be back on Sunday at our uh, usual location in Salford, believing God for God to do some good things on Sunday. Praise God. Pre please pray that, uh, well, there's lots of things to pray for. Can I just give you one that I really want you to pray for? Pastor Edwin and uh, Jackie Melinda's in Chicago. Uh, she was double jabbed. She's still got breakthrough infection. We're going to pray for her. Uh, we're going to pray for people in their church. They've had uh, three people hospitalized. One of the brothers that was here uh, needed uh, intubation. We're going to pray for th them. I think I mentioned that on Sunday. And we mentioned it on our Bible study. Uh, we want to pray for them. Maybe we can pray for them right now. We'll just believe God. Does anybody else have anybody they know is sick in body? If not, yeah, okay. So we're going to pray for them. Yep, yep. We're going to pray for those. I want to pray for Pastor Art. He has uh, terminal cancer. We're going to pray that God would just uh, either work a miracle in his life or make everything comfortable for him. Uh, he's been a good pastor for a long time and pastoring for 40 years. 
and we're going to believe God for him and his family also. So let's lift our hands. We'll just pray that the Lord would move. Heavenly Father, I pray for these men. Lord God, these are, these are important situations. These are not petty. These are important. And we pray that you would heal their bodies, heal their families, work in their churches. I pray that you would heal these workers in Chicago so that they could go back to in-person services, oh God. I'm praying for Pastor Art and Sister Irene that you would help them in Stockton, California, Lord God. Work miracles in their lives. Lord, we pray for our other friends and families that are still here and uh, still sick with COVID or other diseases, Lord God, that you would heal them as well. Lord, we know the pain that they go through and we ask that you would be with them and comfort them and help them. Lord, thank you for meeting every need. I pray for our church, Aspire Church, that you would have your way. Lord, as we reform, as we begin to uh, change our leadership and how we do things, that you would be with us, O oh God, that we would do the right things and make the right decisions and exercise self-control and faith at the same time. Lord, provide for your people. We're careful to give you the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say amen. Praise God. Thank you for coming today. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your week. We'll see you back when we see you Friday or Sunday. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today at Aspire Church. If the message today has blessed you or there's something we can help you with, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email to info at aspirechurch.co.uk. We meet in different locations throughout the week. And if you'd like to join us in person, we'd love to have you visit us. You can find all the details on our website at www.aspirechurch.co.uk. Or if you'd like further information, find us on Facebook, look us up on Twitter. We also live stream all of our services. And once again, if you'd like to view online, you can find all the details on our website. Thank you for joining us today, being part of our ministry. We'd love to help you in any way that we can. God bless you.